April 1990. Six fevered imaginations from the world of fear are gathered for dinner at the Horror Cafe. Their task, to create the ultimate horror movie for the end of the millennium, the year 2000. They take as their starting point Robert Louis Stevenson's classic 19th century horror tale, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Around the table are Lisa Tuttle, who with books like Familiar Spirit, The Nest of Nightmares, and Gabriel, is hailed as one of horror's most innovative and exciting writers. John Carpenter, who launched a thousand slasher movies with the terrifying Halloween. In the chair, Clive Barker, best known for the Hellraiser series of films and the books of Blood, Weave World and Cabal. Roger Corman, director of over 50 films, including The Fall of the House of Usher, he's just directed his first film for 20 years, Frankenstein Unbound. Ramsey Campbell, in novels like The Nameless, Incarnate and The Parasite, he embodies a uniquely British horror tradition which descends from Stoker, Stevenson and Shelley. Peter Atkins, he's a short story writer, novelist and screenwriter. A rising star, he wrote Hellraiser 2 and is currently working on another in the series, Hell on Earth. Let's start in the, in the Socratic manner by defining our terms. Because I, I have a funny feeling we all of us have uh, different attitudes to what horror is, what we do and why we do it, and probably what we will all of us bring to this, this process, the process of creating this movie. So, um, Lisa, here you are. You write very intimate dramas with a lot of blood at the end of them very often. When you get letters from fans, what do they say? How do they articulate their response to what you do? I don't get as many fan letters as you do. <laughs> no, <laughs> Stop. <it's... laughs> what, do, what do they say? They, I mean, if I was going to articulate it, I would say, yes, I would hope that what I write would disturb the mm -hmm. reader, but at the same time, it wouldn't be a kind of, just be a cheap thrill. It would right. be, you know, not just to do it because I can do it and it's scary. You push someone out of a window and <laughs> it might be go. pretty terrifying. But that it would tell them something about themselves, about the human condition, about life. Right. Um, and to do that, I, do, I tend to look in, into what frightens me. Okay. Roger, what frightens you? What frightens me is the fear of losing control. And that's primarily a mental process, that my mind can no longer function, that it is incapable of dealing with the world or with various aspects of the world it's very much i think involved with the unconscious to a certain extent it is the recreation of childhood fears childhood fantasies mm -hmm. and for me the problem or the task in doing a horror film is to break through the defenses of the conscious mind and attack or expose the fears and the fantasies of the unconscious mind john uncertainty my personal fear is like Rogers. I, I fear loss of control. Insanity? In all senses. And seriously, Alzheimer's disease would be a horrifying thing to go through, the most horrifying. As you start leaking out your life and there's nothing left. Right. But what is there? It seems to me as though uh, your scenario uh, means that you're going to be delivered by the simple process of getting older into the bosom of your fears. But isn't it inexorable we are all going towards that uncertain end yeah, sure. of darkness? And then yeah. I think that's everybody's fear is death. What's beyond? Is there anything beyond? Right. And what will the last moments be? Yes. What, will I be a vegetable? Will I remember? Mm -hmm. Will I remember beauty? Will there be any beauty? Or will there be this aching, you, horrifying loneliness? Have you planned any last words yet? I'll be right back. I'll add my, uh, I'll add my uh, two penny worth to it and say that the thing that scares me is banality. Uh, the, the sheer, uh, the banality of the culture we actually live in. Um, uh, I, uh, so my, my sense of, of what's scary is related to the things I see around me. 
and what I see around me are, are people who seem to want to suppress the imagination. And I think we all of us have very fevered imaginative lives, otherwise we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. What's interesting is that we so often turn uh, fever to the business of evoking what seems to be a negative response to other people. That is, giving people a, a chill, uh, making people feel something which uh, under any other circumstances, that is, in their shower, in their kitchen, they wouldn't want to feel. And maybe later on we may want to address why people spend good bucks uh, buying the, the experience when the experience is so clearly under any other circumstances a negative one. If you live through it, but isn't there a sense in which, you know, you could equally say that tragedy, you know, people don't want to f live through tragedy. No, but art gives them the opportunity to live through it imaginatively. Right, yeah. and, that, and, there, and right there is an interesting problem because uh, um, clearly some part of us, maybe the animal part of us, wants to feel fear. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, is excited by fear. The adrenaline rush of fear is, mm. is, is worth having. Well, it's worth pursuing. What John was saying, in a way, because to experience it and walk away from the theater or close the book yeah. actually puts us back in a position of control. We yeah. actually control that fear. So the fear that in real life we have no control over, whether it's fear of the unknown, fear of dissolution, fear of whatever anybody mm -hmm. said, what it, whenever that experience is turned into a fiction, whether mm -hmm. it's cinematic or literary, in some sense, it's a saving grace that it is a fiction, that we can walk out, we can close mm. it. It gives us back that control. Well, certainly you're controlling it if you're writing it or mm. if you're making well, well, I think it. Well, you, no, if I you're think reading it, you're putting yourself into the hands of the author or Absolutely, the for the duration of 200 pages or 90 minutes and or whatever. And you're trusting, yes, that you yeah, can you're walk trusting away that it will stop. End. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, your life the millennial be... movie should stop well, them walking away. Well, exactly. Yeah. And, and also, or they'll change their life. They think they walk away. Exactly. Fact, See, I think isn't our changed. highest ambition that people are not going to walk away and say, hey, well, that was mm. the equivalent of a good pizza. Sure. You know, our, our highest ambition is that people will walk away and say, to the nearest My institution. God! <laughs> no, not to an institution. But, say, but, but it did change But it did lives. change, yeah. Even I've they walk away, say that with just an enjoyable movie, ha ha ha, but mm. it actually stays with So do we them. have psychotic mm. elements in ourselves that Wanting says, why do they yes. read our books and watch our movies? They want because to they feel. want to feel mm. something. And that's I was feeling well, nothing. Well, you know. well then you're yes, back to but now That's interesting. The idea of mm. just being, feeling and something is better than anything. You're anesthetized. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And what you're talking about, society, you're anesthetized. When I saw my f the, the movie that changed my life was, was a film called It Came From Outer Space, 1952, hmm. 3D. Ray, Ray Bradbury did the... He did a short story. Right. Yeah. Harry Essex uh, uh, wrote the script. Jack Arnold directed it. Right. 3D. Mm -hmm. yeah. Glasses on. This meteor comes <laughs> screaming out of the night sky and blows up in my four-year-old face. <laughs> and I felt something. <laughs> And I got up and I was shrieking in terror. But I'll, I've got to tell you, a couple of seconds later, it was the greatest because I felt such a high. You'd survived. I survived the meteor hitting me right in the face. It mm -hmm. came out of the screen, blew up in my face. I wanted, to, I wanted to do that. I wanted to experience that because I was alive. It told me I was alive. It was early, earlier stated or suggested that what we're doing is giving a negative experience. I don't think in any way it's a negative experience. I okay. think it's a positive and very helpful experience, both on the basis of what John said, and also if you go into a Freudian interpretation, I don't want to go too deeply into that. Freud's under the table. <laughs> right. Uh, where he should stay at least for the moment. Uh, if you are touching some fear in the unconscious mind, according to Freudian theory, mm -hmm. by exposing that fear, by bringing it to the surface, you can actually help the patient, as it were. So yes. I would prefer to think of ourselves as yes. psychiatrists Therapists. helping <laughs> the audiences. Could we, our could, we, could we compromise on psychotic psycho psychiatrists? <laughs> right, exactly. But I think all Which psychiatrists are vaguely suspect anyway. <laughs> why, yeah. why go into that? This yeah. seems like the grayer the hair, the further away we get from... Uh, uh, in other words, the older you get, I think the more you fear what, what Roger started to talk about. And the younger you are, the more you value experience, and the more you value, I want to go to a rock concert, or I want to go to see some kind of thing that moves me. When you're young, mm -hmm. when you get older, all you want to do is hang on. It's like you're, you're going <laughs> off a cliff, 
I think that's why older people don't enjoy horror, horror movies. movies. Huh. They don't enjoy them anymore. I hear people say to me, I appreciate your films, but I can't see them anymore because I don't want to be scared anymore. But you do. Mm. You know, you're, you're 20 years older than you were when you made Dark Star. But you but, still but, make But movies don't work the same way as they did when I was four years old and it came from outer space or when I first saw Not of This Earth. Right. And this thing came over somebody's head and, and something happened underneath and this blood came across the table in one of Roger's movies. Mm. Oh, right. oh my God, what happened under there? Oy. Special effects. <laughs> now I understand that. So you say. Uh, okay, so I'm going to propose we start as a, just as a starting place, I, I have my views about this. Uh, we start with, a, with an old structure, Robert Louis Stevenson's Jekyll and Hyde, as a starting place for the debate on where we, where we take this story. I have, my view for what it's worth is that this is, and I know Lisa disagrees with this, uh, um, it's a 19th century conceit with a boring moral dichotomy bang in the middle of it, <laughs> but, uh, hey. Well, I agree that it is a 19th century conceit, but if you think back to what was happening in the 19th century, this really was the beginning of the modern age of science. Uh, and I think Stevenson, in England, as Poe, was in the United States, was beginning to grapple with what science was developing, both in the psychological sciences and in the physical sciences. Mm -hmm. And Mary Shelley, to a large extent, was doing the same thing. And the works of Stevenson, of Poe, and of Shelley have lasted today and will continue to be important works, I think, because they deal with a change from what you might om almost call a pre-scientific way of life to a scientific way of life, much of what we do now is based upon science and its developments in the practical world, and I think that will continue. Yeah, but they also, I mean, even though they were written 19th century and 18th mm -hmm. century, and, is that they are about psychology, or they're, I mean, even if they didn't have the kind of Freudian superstructure that we have, right, you right. Know, that we're writing out of, it, it's still the same thing. It's they, this subconscious or the unconscious coming out. I mean, certainly in, in so, Jekyll and Hyde. So in a, in, a, in a straightforward reading of Jekyll and Hyde, we have the good doctor, Dr. Jekyll, suppressing, in Freudian sense, I suppose he is yeah. suppressing, yeah. Um, a Pretending sensual, mm -hmm. sexual self mm -hmm. uh, that erupts in the form of an alter ego. But it, it, it's but the it's personality still. does exactly what you're talking about. Exactly. When people split off they their split personality, it off. that's not they, me. They don't have to take responsibility for what my Ramsey part does. You see, <laughs> he's another person. That's another. That's a, a whole other yeah. person. I, I'm okay. Yeah. So I maybe you should tell you know Do Dr. Carpenter and Mr. Campbell. <laughs> I mean, is that a more scary idea? But I also think there's two things in the Jekyll and Hyde story that have come up just talking around the table about what's frightening. There's the losing control, mm -hmm. which is throughout the story because that it begins by. Uh, Dr. Jekyll thinking he's got complete control and gradually realizing he doesn't. That's part of the horror of it. Mm -hmm. But the other part is other people, that Hyde is another person. It's out there. Mm -hmm. It's not him, and it isn't him. Can I, he refuses isn't to it say also crucially a, a, a story about someone who's obsessed with purifying himself by a somehow objectifying... The, 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 the supposed evil self. I mean, isn't it partly mm. about precisely yeah, but the fact he wants yeah. to put it out there and this causes it to become monstrous? Okay. There's an essential question that you have to answer and it's, 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 it's basic when you make a film. There's two kinds of, there's a left-wing horror and a right-wing horror. Mm -hmm. Now, the right-wing mm -hmm. horror, we're all a tribe and the evil is out, out there. there. Right. It's mm -hmm. going to come and get us. Right. It is uh, the beast from 20,000 fathoms. It's the atomic monsters. Okay. There's also a left-wing horror, and it's right in yeah. here. The, the other way of looking at it is from the outside, is the way the story is told. For most of the story, it's other people are seeing Jekyll, who becomes Hyde. Now, that's horrific, and that's maybe right-wing horror. That's who knows what other people might be. Mm -hmm. What this nice young man who lives next door to you may be Jack the Ripper. Yes. And that's horrifying, and that's horrifying to but us now. But it's not me. But I it's know not that, me. and I'm safe. It's, I'm safe, because I'd never drink those horrible chemicals and that's turn into right. Jack the Ripper. Well, except that the... But, well. if you want to read it the other way around, from the point of view of, of Dr. Jekyll, right. it's, I've got to find out who I really am. 
so I drink the chemicals and it takes me over. It just seems to me that it's an extremely, and I mean this, I, I can't have more contempt in my, my voice than when I use the word conservative. It, it is the <laughs> most conservative <laughs> of narratives, isn't it? In the yeah. sense that what it says is, you know, there is this buried part of you which is going to do you the most terrible harm don't let the damn thing out. Yeah, so, he's in all of us. But the fear. Yeah, but I think the <laughs> what part about of your rage, your murderous rage. You aren't see, you afraid of it? No, I'm Coming not. Coming out? It seems to me you have to find ways to dramatize and shape the rage you feel. I think that's very important. And I think that the, the, the drama which, which sets this rage up as being something which is dangerous to you, as opposed to, for instance, potentially creative, which I think is interesting. I mean, here we are, creati a creative half dozen. What are we using to make our creativity? We're making strange. We, we're, we're making strange fictions of strange things inside ourselves, and I think that's a very important process. And so, I, I think coming to peace, coming to coming to a place of, of, of comprehension, self comprehension, where you embrace the dark side. But seems can you important. embrace? I don't know. I worry about that. I think that's a well, little bit. Well, here we are, too. all dressed in black. I think we're not doing too badly. <laughs> too oh, happy. Oh, not all so, uh, you're wearing a black T-shirt. Well, uh, I'll strip no. off in a while. I mean, I, I. Okay. I don't like this. I, the whole idea of putting the evil outside and saying, you know, it's it's out there, and even the whole concept of evil. But no, no, I'm not Why saying not? you're saying that. Why well, not? I'm, Okay. We're always saying that the evil is on the outside. What makes you uncomfortable about it being outside our tribe? Oh, no, I'm frequently afraid of people outside my because tribe. Because isn't that primitive I man mean, sitting around the fire and the, and the sounds out in the night? Yeah. And, okay, we're all right. We're all but right. But I don't think we're all right. No. You don't think so, huh? I don't. <laughs> so you think the murderers are within the so, tribe? No, no, what I'm trying to say is, so don't get me off oh, this, sorry. is that I don't think you can accept. I think it's too wishy-washy to say, let's just accept our dark side. Because how do you accept Auschwitz? How do you accept extermi mass extermination, genocide? I mean, I, that's, maybe you didn't personally do it. I never personally uh, I just, participated. I, but I don't think you can just say, well, let's just accept that. All right, all right, all right. It is part of human life. Auschwitz took place and it will always have taken place. It cannot be erased. We cannot deny it. All right, so we're coming to, we're, we're, we're to get back on track to a movie. <laughs> we're making a movie which is going to talk, at least uh, to some degree, about things that happened in the 20th century. We've just been talking about uh, atrocities which, uh, we've still got 10 years to go, but I think we can reasonably assume are going to be uh, one of the, the darkest and, and foulest things that occurred in the century through which we've been living. Um, let me ask a question about, uh, about the way that we could turn that kind of horror into an entertainment, and would we dare? To uh, make an entertainment out of it, but that was the word you used, well, I'm, and I'm sure I'm using the word entertainment well, there for a but what about work of art? No, yeah, I mean, well, do you draw I, the line? I mean, do, we, do we want an Oscar for it? I think there's first a difference between a work of art and an Oscar. Well said. The I have for movies is the passion of a big populist media. Yeah, it has to be fun. You have to enjoy it. Right. So, so... I enjoy the fact, in The Hungry Moon, that there's something down in that pit. Oh, sure. I want to see it. I love it. I love that idea that right. there's something down in there. It's not something that assaults me and makes me turn away from the screen and run out and feel bad. It makes me feel good mm -hmm. when right. I read it. So what? I see it in the movie. I think we ought to do his... his, uh, his you want to do... We should do Hungry Moon? <laughs> <laughs> should we should make a film of Hungry Moon? I think so. Here's, here's the starting place for a narrative, which I've, I've never been able to get on beyond the first sentence, okay? A guy goes into a... A, a, go, a guy goes into a bookstore and he sees the, the hit paperback. It's a... It's a... It's a... A, a real-life biography, okay? Uh, it's about a Dennis Nielsen or a Sutcliffe or whoever. And it's about a murderer who has not yet been found. It's mm. about somebody who has committed murders across an entire city, New York or London or wherever else. And he goes and he's a nice businessman, he's a nice, he's an ordinary middle class guy with kids and a family and so on. And he picks up this thing and he looks at it and he flicks through the murder photographs which are inside, you know, the, photo, the, the, the murder scene photographs. And he says to himself, I did this. I, 
I did this. This is me. This is my story. This is my biography. In other words, it's, it's Jekyll discovering that, that he's he high. Yeah. So you start with the moment where the guy picks mm -hmm. up his biography and says, my God, <laughs> it's me. The second scene might have a, have a woman looking at the book and saying, my God, it's me. And the third oh, scene nice. might be another man looking at the book and saying, it's me. Because in the 19th century science and psychology that Stevenson dealt with, it was the individual scientist. And if you think back to the workings of scientists, it was generally one inventor, whether it was Benjamin Franklin earlier or Thomas Edison or somebody like that. But if you think of science today, it isn't one inventor. It is a group of scientists working for a university or a corporation or a, gov or a government. So if you took the analogy of one man, Jekyll, in the 19th century and moved it to our collectivist, although collectivist is not good. a good word these days, no. society, it could then be a number of people, if not everybody, but that might be a little bit difficult to dramatize. <laughs> 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 if you, want to you lose your audience then. Right. I think. Mm. On the other hand, well, you bring them in. it's you. Everybody in the audience yes, is right. uh, a potential. But then what we've coach. got is a story in which, in which an experiment has been done by a large group of people. Yes. Maybe half, well, let's say a, half a dozen people. Yes. Three men, three women. An experiment has been done to inquire into the nature of human evil. Thank you very much. And something terrible has happened as a consequence, which has both divided these people in the sense that they've been able to go out into the world and do these terrible things, but has also made them forget that they ever did it. Which isn't implausible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's such a it's been such a terrible experience, mm. this confrontation with their secret selves, that they have simply blanked it out from there. In a weird way, it could take us back to the Auschwitz uh, situation mm -hmm. that we were talking about earlier. That wasn't one person. That was a group of right. people who did it. And I feel very much that a work of entertainment should work on several levels. Yeah. But on one level, it is an entertainment, and underneath. It does have some meaning if to, the, if to the writer or the creator, if to nobody else. Mm -hmm. But it's that meaning underneath that gives solidity and strength mm -hmm. to the structure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think these people could all be not necessarily working together, but working in different countries, in different groups. Because usually when something's discovered, it's not one little group working in England or America. It's across, you know, around right. the world. Mm -hmm. and, but they are now connected with each other. But why do they do it? Why? why do they murder? But also, what's why triggering them? Why do, why do people murder? Why? Yeah, exactly. Power. What makes them murder? Control. The ultimate control is making somebody's breath cease or making it start. Is it? Well, except that we're already... Sounds I think on. Once you move from the individual to this group thing, that these are the, the metaphorical equivalents of camp commandants or whatever, this, the feeling is that you want to find something beyond that, some kind of single guiding intelligence. And it's not so much why they did it as who made them do it. I mean, maybe the fourth scene after Roger's third scene <laughs> is that somebody says, he thinks it's him, she thinks it's her, he thinks it's him. It was none of them. It, I planted something in these people, which is now awakening for the millennium. All right, then I want, I want the ritual murders of right. all these six. I want there to be something cabalistic about this. Okay. I want, ah, right. I want these six uh, murderers around the world killing particular numbers of people in particular right. locations to be awakening a larger, darker force. I it's the right. dawning of the new <clears throat> millennium. It's new the society. dawning of the bad news. <laughs> right, also, yeah. also, they become, while they're doing this, whatever it is, it isn't just a matter of discovering, oh my God, it's me, how awful I must stop. Yeah. It's also... Their other selves, the people they are when they murder, have a tenacious hold on life, as did Hyde. They want, and what this new world they're bringing into being is for them. It's going to be good for them. All right, but the difference is Hyde, Hyde is also sexually motivated. Hmm. There's also sexual satisfaction in what Hyde is pursuing, the, at least sensual satisfaction. Um, do we need, I think we need sex in this movie. You need sex in every movie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> There's always sex. And here's a man who's made himself a very rich man by doing him by proving me. But I have a problem. Can I, can I bring up a problem? I'm not yeah. scared yet. Good. This is all in a light. It's all right in here. Yeah. I'm not scared yet. 
But this is all pre credit I'm not stuff, terrified. Well, I'm not terrified yet. <laughs> if somebody opening a book and realizing he's a murderer, I'm having trouble identifying. Well, I, as an audience member, I have, to, I have to identify with characters on the screen, and things have to happen to them. And a person opens a book and says, you know, I dreamt that, and I'm the murderer, and I'm, I'm nodding my head as yes. an audience member, and I don't feel my, my blood pressure rising or my heart beating. Where, where is the sequence... Is it because he's not an innocent? I mean, because it's I because we don't know anything about him. Because as an audience member, I have to ad I have to identify with something on the screen that says, "Okay, that's me. Yeah. That's a quality in me." Yeah. And oh my God, something's going to happen to me. So are we? So all right. So so the first thing we have to do is be scary. The worst thing you can have is a horror movie. That isn't scary. Sure. No one will come. And the millennium will arrive. <laughs> we will end up living in poverty. <laughs> we've got to get a studio to make this picture. We've got to go in and talk to the head of the studio, and we've got to say, here is why you're going to wet your pants when you see this film, because right. it's going to scare you. Right, right. And the problem with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and I, I agree with you, is that intellectually, is, it, it's one thing, but it doesn't frighten me. I was me. just saying, maybe it's just the approach. You don't begin with someone you don't know. Discovering right. that he's a murderer, it means sure. nothing. Yeah, I mean, so that might be a scary. structural Which problem. Which one of us can, can make that scary? I mean, we can make it, we can make it work as a, as a drama, but where, where does the, f the fear come? Well, that's where what I think Lisa's is right. I, I think it's a structural though. thing. You don't start with that. Mm. I, I don't know what we do start with yet. But well, I think, I think the thing that's going to score the larger us second is, scene interests is the me. sleeping dragon. Where do we go from there? It might be that one or more of these people says, my God, it's me. I killed. I will kill again, but I don't want to kill again. And maybe there's some fear coming out of that. The person who is driven either singly or as a portion of a group to kill knows he's going to kill and saying, I will not kill. And I think within that conflict... But you see, for else. me, my, my problem is that I don't find uh, the notion of m murder, being murdered in my bed, hugely scary. Maybe murder itself is too simple a concept. And so when you say, my God, it's me, it's not only murder, it's something beyond that. Whether you go into a supernatural, mm -hmm. whether you go into a psychological, whether you go into genetic engineering, whether you go into something that we don't know. It is, so, I'm a monster. Yes, mm -hmm. and I'm a monster, <clears throat> if we're talking about the turn of the century, the turn of the new century, I am a monster in a new way, unknown to people before. A new type of monster, a new type of horror, something that says, Time has passed. I think these basic fears have been with mankind forever mm -hmm. and very possibly will be. But the way in which they're uh, approached, the way in which they're uh, interpreted, changes from age to age. So it's still the concept of murder, but it's a new look at murder. It may not even be murder itself. It may be simply the changing of a person into something else, which would be the murder of the earlier persona and the emergence of a new, either better or more evil persona. But I think we're still talking in intellectual realms. I'm, I, I still think that the, the, the movies work best when they present you with an image, which you go, whoa. Yes. I mean, you know, um, and, and you're kind of sh almost shocked by the, by, the, by the newness of the image. Your popcorn has to fly. Your popcorn <laughs> has to fly. You're watching the movie with a, bo with a sack of popcorn and you're eating it. And, ah, and it goes, yes. that's scary. That, I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's no, no. also a jump. And do and we you grab your girlfriend? Yeah. Do we want to and fondle her? Yeah, yeah. Right. That's right. Do do or do. She fondles you, whichever one you want. <laughs> do we want to distinguish just for a moment between the scare and the jump? Because I do think there's a difference. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. But there are two ways to approach it. Uh, the scare is easier, and it lasts. Uh, it's a shorter duration. The jump is easier, shorter. Yes. It's right, the yeah. scare. Yeah. The suspense is, okay. is lasts suspense. longer. Right. And it, it uh, drives you, uh, it makes you uncomfortable. Right, right. And the release is, is, is uh, heaven sent. I think you use both. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a scare. You have to, be, you have to scare people. Mm -hmm. Keeping people in suspense is, is, um, is a little bit more difficult. You have to give information to the audience. You have to tell the audience ahead of the characters. In other words, Clive, there's somebody coming up behind you, but you don't see them and they've got something they're going to plunge right into the top of your head.
and skewer your brain. But we know that, but you don't know that. So you're talking on and on about various things. And we start to feel, won't you just turn around and stop talking? That's suspense. <laughs> he tells it well, doesn't he? We can lard it with scares and jumps later. We also have to decide here what area we're touching on that will be the, the big suspense thing. I mean, if this is a, a millennium movie, I mean, perhaps the theme should be millennialist. I mean, we're, we touched on it before, that there should be something mm. behind this. A because dark millennialist a dark, mil <laughs> a dark millennialist movement, which both promises change, therefore we're excited because it's not banal, um, but equally is terribly unpleasant. Um, so we, we half, because isn't this the secret of the suspense thing rather than the scare? We want it to happen, we want it to happen, we don't want it to happen, we don't want it to happen. Mm. And so I, I think behind these initial scenes that we've talked about, we should decide that mm -hmm. there's something going on. There's Indeed. the plot. The, 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 the plot. That's what we need. <laughs> yes, right. We're missing something I think essential here. We're talk I think human beings are most frightened of uncertainty. Yes. They're looking for certainty in life, in, in, in religion, in, in jobs, in, in work, in home. Everything comes to tell us Tomorrow will be a lot like today. I can improve it, but I can depend on it. Mm. It's there. If I touch something, I know it's solid. I know that the sun will rise tomorrow. I know certain things will happen. Therefore, there's a rhythm to life. There's a certainty to life. And way down the line, maybe years from now, I'll deal with problems. Mm -hmm. But right now, everything is okay. Now, you, you, you add uncertainty. And I think people get very uncomfortable with it. I think this is what the millennium represents to most people, is uncertainty. See, I, I think that siding with the, with the forces of anarchy, mm -hmm. with the forces of disruption and darkness, may actually be a solution. And that the, the, the real terror of, 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 the, of, of, of 2001 is that is that it will be like the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. I don't mean Ooh. that the movie is bland, but that the vision of the world of is the bland. movie is bland. That everything is antiseptic, mm -hmm. that, everything, that the, these are lives which are being lived in a very functional, robotic kind of way. Mm -hmm. And given the choice between the robot and the demon, I will choose the demon every time. I want to be the dark, sensual, fluid, mm -hmm. protean thing which I think human beings can be. And my major terror, when I was a kid and I watched Doctor Who, my terror of the Daleks was the terror of something which was soulless, mm -hmm. that, 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 had no, um, that had no moral component whatsoever and no imaginative component mm -hmm. that worked like a train worked along the same sure. track. That yeah. seems to me to be so much more terrifying than your thing, you can argue which with can the devil. change. You can argue with the devil. Uh, you can probably you can get laid by the cleaner, devil. Though. You're talking <laughs> about Republicans <laughs> in the United States, Reagan, Reaganites. That's what you're talking about, really. They're the most terrifying. I'm, I, thing. I'm in terror of Reaganites. <laughs> <laughs> that's, what that's what you're fighting of most. Well, maybe I am. Maybe I am. Oh, maybe I'm club. scared of anything that because they're the so frightened track. of what happened in the, in the world in in, in um, the Western culture in the 60s and 70s. They're so frightened of of sexuality and, and issues of, uh, like abortion, and what it does, and the kind of questions, that's what's tearing America apart right now. Mm. I think maybe you're not so much frightened of the Reaganites as of the triumph of the Reaganites. Mm -hmm. And if we, with Bush riding very high in the polls in the United States right Huge. now, the Reagan-Bush concepts will exist for a certain amount of time. So if you're talking about some theme of which to fear, uh, and you want to make a horror film, uh, there may be something to do with uh, just 10 years from now, uh, the triumph of this type of thinking in society, and maybe something comes against it. As you said, the demon comes against that anarchy uh, maybe is preferable. So then we've got Dionysus oh, against good. Apollo, yeah, right. and we've got something very, very interesting and classical going on. And then the whole well, I think we've also got essentially is something that would genuinely scare the audience, is which side it's going to root for. Yes. Well, basically, you've got to make the dark side 
genuinely appealing, as, as indeed it is. But for a change, you've got to celebrate it fully. How do we make the dark side appealing? You see, what it's not hard. <laughs> well, it's not hard. That's <laughs> well, no, it's not hard. Half an hour ago, you were talking, about, ago, you're you're talking was... about a whole regimented. I mean, it, it depends on what you're putting in opposition to it. Well, if because you're if, Darth what you're Vader, in, uh, if what you're putting in opposition yes, to precisely. it is is you know a wonderful sunny world, and yep. here is just this one awful thing. Mm -hmm. But if what you're putting against it is a world in which everything is under control. It's tightly controlled. People may be afraid of losing control, but you also don't want to live in a society in which you are in total control. I think you have well, to keep appeal avoiding that. <laughs> to a universal emotion in people. Not their thoughts, but their emotions. You have to get down to their feelings. Right. And it has to be universal. It has to work in India. It has to work in the United States. It has to work in, in Great Britain. It has to work everywhere, emotionally. A big monster that's scary, it walks through that door. We all react the same way. Mm -hmm. We oh. talk about politics. Well, I don't know if we do, I actually, argue. do we? I the thing know. in the pit, uh -huh. in, in, in your story, the thing that's down there, if it was real and it came out, I guarantee you, everybody at this table, we'd all run away from it. We would. I would. Ah, I would. wrote it. <laughs> yeah, it's it belongs to you. Clive right. is claiming otherwise. I, mean, I am absolutely you, claiming you otherwise. He's got great hands. He'd yeah, say, right. let's talk. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, I also, yeah, I yeah, also think if the archangel Gabriel appears with those doors, instead of our waiter, we'd also be terrified. Every angel is terrifying. Exactly. In other words, I think that the absolute forces for good, if rarefied and presented to us in some glowing celestial form would skirt the bejesus like out of us. beauty? You mean, you're talking yes. about a beautiful, I think, perfect person I walked think through the door that was scary? That's not scary. Oh, you're but kidding me. But then you me. go beyond yeah. terror into awe, don't you? you I'll know, disagree because I'm not, I'm not a writer like, like all of you. I'm I, I, making movies and you have to show something visually that's scary. Oh, sure. Oh, but no, 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 I'm... What next? I, I did. More. Yeah, exactly. More sure. and more and more and more. Possibly more of the same. Yes. And hopefully at the end, e you know, you resolve it one way or the other. Either you don't resolve it which is the most frightening of all. You can't resolve it. Which We're sitting in the snow, Chill. and I don't know if Roger's a creature or a human, and I don't know if I am. <laughs> He's the Let's just sit around the that's much scarier. But don't you think, that's, that's, much scarier. that's, scarier. that's, that's scarier. No, than it would if you were sitting next but to an ugly monster but let me tell that you was originally most scary. The audience doesn't think that's scary, because I've been through it. They, they get angry at that. Huh. They want to know. The, I, sh I, had a, I had a research screening of the mm -hmm. thing. I showed this film to a bunch of teenagers. Mm -hmm. And one teenage girl, 14 years old, she said, well, what happened in the end? And the two men were sitting out in the snow. And I said, well, that's, that's part of the nature of the, of the, of the story. You, you have to use your imagination. And she said, oh, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I pay oh. you $5 for yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't tell me yeah. what to yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> the audience, whether it's in a motion picture or in a book, must participate with the artist. So part of it comes from the artist, and there's a feedback and a response from the audience. And that girl... I, I would hope is a very minor, <laughs> for all our sakes, a very minor <laughs> point I, of the I, audience. I, 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 think she's, I think she's a growing part of the audience. I think that's part of the banality of the culture, part of the spoon-fed element of the culture. Uh, young people are asked to use their imaginations less and less. And you know, in a way, we do a wretched thing to them. We teach them the reality of Santa Claus and Oz and Never Never Land up until the age of five. And then we tell them at the age of five, that was all lies. Um, here's the gross national project of Chile, you know. And <laughs> <laughs> so we've got this very bland 1999 <laughs> vision of the world. Uh, we've got a place in which imagination has been scoured, not just from the five-year-old, but from the whole culture. Um, Ninety percent of the people in the United States believe in the supernatural, believe in God. How many percent? Ninety. 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 You also have that going for you. <laughs> you have it. And some of them are fundamentalists, and some of them well, are... That's the are, bad news, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not yeah. to some. And right. some fundamentalists... Man, now listen, some fundamentalists believe there is an in infestation of Satanism. Sure. Literal Satanism in the United States. Oh, it's got here too. Believe me. And well, the Satanism or the belief? The <laughs> belief. <laughs> the belief. A literal believe devil, me, yeah. a literal evil. Sure. Right. And now we're back to the tribe in the, in, in the fire, mm. and he's out there. And if you're talking about 90% of the population believes that. Yes. 
Well, they're not listening to the fact of uh, 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 Robert Louis Stevenson or Freud or anybody that sure. comes from in here. It's out there. Well, it's, then it's and our job. we can job. destroy it. With, but it's it's exactly. If we, if we do this. All we have to do is act together. If we're Van Helsing's. Right. The movie's going to be a witch hunt movie. It's going to begin with a witch hunt, isn't it? Okay. The religious know. are going to hunt the our, evil. Our, our innocent man. Now there's then scary. Well, there's scary. Yeah, that's right. Maybe that's he Hitchcock's begins scary, by thinking, isn't it? Which why is not start The idea that? of the guy, you get up in yeah. the morning and you're the innocent. wrong man. Huh? And suddenly... Mm. They've got you. They've got you. That right. is a but major, major right. terror. Yeah. Right. But then you then discover you that, that you're you guilty. That you're guilty. That you're right. Mm. But, or the maybe, case, but even though you don't remember. But maybe, well, except that maybe you're committing crimes for the right reasons. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> because you don't know, and they're I mean, keeping you uh -huh. trapped. Maybe you're flying. Maybe you're flying in the face of the of the status quo for the right reasons. Yeah. But that's the trick we want to play on the audience then, isn't it? Yeah. That we want to, in the end, make them celebrate the ambiguity that, okay, this, whatever it is, is preferable to the Reaganite Bush thing, but it's got a lot of funny dark edges to it itself. It won't be a yeah. hit. It won't be a hit. No, it doesn't have to be a hit. We want to make a great movie. Oh, we're going to make a good movie. Oh, all right, we're going to all right, so, so we're, gonna, we're not going to make a hit, we're going to make a great, great movie. movie. Right. What do we have? We're assuming so we have the best have producers. Ask, Roger, do you agree with that? Should we make a hit, Roger, or should we just make a hit? <laughs> a cult <laughs> classic. A cult classic. That's what we're making. Yeah. So what do we have? What, what, what do we have? What's on the table so far? We have two evils, one of which we're going to end up saying is an evil, mm -hmm. which is the Reaganite thing, and one of which we're going to end up saying, well, yeah, you know, maybe it's an evil, but it's life. It's okay, fun. so it's so life. From, yeah. the, from, yeah. the, from, from the very dangerous pit right. comes this personification of blandness. Okay, what is it for you? What is the what personification is of blandness? It's what does it look like? What does it wear? It, well, it wears white. It certainly wears white. It probably mm. quotes the Bible California, a lot. Then, yeah. It and looks precisely the same, and it comes to every, everybody's front door at once. <laughs> If Ooh, you're yes. talking about something that comes to everybody's door right. at the same time, in the United States, every 10 years, which would be in the year 2000, because it's happening now, oh, is the census. census. And it oh, may well. very well be that in a very heavily yeah, controlled society, hmm. the census would be something to be very much afraid of. All right, so... Uh -huh. I don't oh, know how you can make open, no, open, it, but you might. Opening, you opening scene of the movie, a, a, a beautiful little town, Smallville, yeah? The town of, of Halloween, you know? Haddonfield. Haddonfield. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a town where the, everything is reassurance. High summer. When does the census come? Does it matter? It comes the uh, mid summer. Must, no, yeah. April, yeah. weirdly enough, April Fool's Day. April 1st. <laughs> April 1st. <laughs> April 1st in this tiny little town, and these vans appear, these cars appear, yeah. yes? And in each of them, is a similarly dressed man or woman who goes, spreads throughout the town, and they look sweet mm. and bland. And when they come to the doorsteps of each of the individuals, each of the individuals who opens the door says, you remind me f vaguely of somebody. Right. And the person says, we just want to know well, how many kids you've got, how many rooms there are in your house, whether you have a pet. What else do they ask in censuses? It gets deeper and deeper. And this is something that, yeah. you know, that could be worked in. Every consecutive census has become more intrusive. Invasive, right? Yes, yes. invasive is a better word, and personal liberty. So it could well be that a census 10 years from now could be the most startling and frightening of all. I, okay, okay, I have, I have a, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 you. The, the really frightening thing about the guy who appears on your doorstep is not only that he will be invasive, but that he will know things about you that you assume nobody oh. knew. Oh. They know something that you thought was your secret. And I, I think that's that's the fear yeah. of the census taker. It's not simply that he's going to ask how many bathrooms you've got, but he already, knows. Got, but but he he already knows exactly. No, I, I, I have a, I have a, <laughs> in the he's yes, a right. yeah. he has I have, no feelings. I have a master plan for this for these census people. You know, is it the Mormons who are gathering up? the names of everybody who ever lived on the planet. Is it the Mormons or yes, Jehovah's Witnesses? Is it the Mormons? The Mormons are, um, have constructed a giant record, so if you want to trace out your ancestors, mm -hmm. you can go to Salt Lake oh, or really? take Salt Lake. The census gatherers are, are finding all the names of all these people and all the details because they want a complete and final record before, on January the 1st, 
the year 2000, in other words, the morning after our movie premieres, right. they destroy the world. They incinerate the world. In other words, they have the ultimate anal retentives desire. That okay. is to have... Make it safe. No, Make it neat. Right. <laughs> to have, exactly. They to have, have a, complete, a complete record, and having got a complete record, to then incinerate the whole thing. Because you don't need the thing once you've got it written down. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. Once you've got it. That's once you've made a hologram of it. Cool. <laughs> the, 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 the ultimate, ultimate is great. It's that's better great for the insurance to sure, get rid of the original. Sure. And that, you, you that gives us our hero's motivation. Well, that's right. Our because hero is the man who won't reveal everything. Exactly. Okay. Well, but well, that's interesting because that's but he a twist know this on. Is what's going to happen? Because well, you have to find out. Wouldn't we normally happen. assume? Yeah, right, right. Wouldn't we normally assume that the bad guy is the man who would not reveal everything? No, we well, don't. No, we no. assume somebody who turns up on your doorstep and asks you questions is the bad guy. I really do think so. Even well, the people no, who are I agree. on the side that, of the That is a bad takers. guy. That it is doesn't a bad have guy. to be a guy. Thank you very much. I think what you've got to have is a body in the bathroom. Someone he's just killed. Uh huh. And. That's the problem, that he is actually okay. hiding a guilty secret. Okay. Because oh, if he's right. just not, Very doesn't good. want to tell them about right. himself, good. but if it's a Very real, right. genuine well, guilty secret... Well, that gets back secret. to the two evils. Well, that's okay. wonderful, then. then. But where's the horrible monster? Behind the census, behind the census, census takers. Behind the census is he takers. Is he off a man? Is he under there? Is he at something some, hideous? Well, let's I say, think. Is he from well, hell? That's they live. He's done everything. But I mean, is, <laughs> is, is this I mean, the census? Look at Repulsion. Have to be the monster. Did you remember yes. Repulsion? Mm -hmm. Repulsion is the scariest movie I ever saw. Do you recall when she goes to the mirror and, and she moves show. it and there's, and there's somebody in the background, but it's in her mind? That movie... Yeah. Again, That's the scariest. It's a popcorn jumper. For well, it's not got nothing to do with it in her mind. I mean, I think it's, it's something quite different. It's a film. The mo tenant. I, it's the most frightening film. It's a terrifying movie seen. to me. He jumps out of the window twice. Sure. Uh -huh. He looks across, and there's somebody over there, and he goes over, and there's hieroglyphics in the mm. bathroom. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It's I think brilliant. things like that are scarier. Yes. Sure. Well, just, you see the trace of the but monster. But they didn't make money. You we don't see money. the monster. We've <laughs> got to make some bucks here. So, monsters, Roger? I don't think it's absolutely necessary to have a physical monster. Okay. I think the concept of evil or the concept of a monster can work just as well, though it's more difficult to do. But I think if it's done correctly, it becomes a finer work than simply showing a monster. I think you did that in The House of Usher. Mm -hmm. I think that movie kind of exemplifies what we're talking about. The entire house was the, the monster. Was was the disintegration of yeah. this. That's how, sure. the, that's how the film got made. I was trying to convince AIP to make the fall of the House of Usher, and I had him about three quarters convinced. And one of the executives there said, Roger. We're prepared to go forward, but there's no monster here. <laughs> and I said, the house <laughs> is the monster. Yeah. They financed the film, and I wrote the line, the house is a monster, into the script. And Vincent Price was the leading man. And hmm. Vincent came to me on the day we were shooting, and he said, Roger, what does this line mean? I said, <laughs> and I said, Vincent, that's the line that enabled us to make this <laughs> film. <laughs> he house, said, fine. So listen, wait a moment, yes. because surely isn't The Intruder a good horror movie? It's a fine horror movie. It could be con yeah. considered to be, again. And I, so I think... Where, where's the monster in that? Where we don't locate it, it'd be very difficult, wouldn't it? So just as John said, there are two types of horror movies, a left horror movie and a right horror movie that you could break it down into another classification a horror movie in which you have a physical monster that you can see mm -hmm. and another type in which you have the essence of the monster but you don't see mm -hmm. the special effects the and I think that's scarier yes. I yeah. think the one where you don't see the monster because when you see the monster it's something that can be destroyed it's something that can be attacked it may be killed you may pour a bucket of water on it and it melts down <laughs> shrieking but huh. if you never actually see it, it's harder to come to grips with it. Well, it and, I mean, maybe that's too intellectual. Depends on how big the monster is. If you can do a monster, big. It depends on how big. You can do a monster that you have never seen before. That when the audience looks at it, the visual image is so terrifying. Hmm. Then you've hit a home run. But For the easier moment. thing to do is to do the shadows on the wall. I. But it's really harder to that's do. Not, I don't. It's very that hard true? to the do. Thing, the thing didn't work on the level of the, the monster. I think audiences enjoyed the monster yeah. too much in the thing. It's not like Alien. The thing doesn't work like Alien. The thing works because... Alien is a good example. 
Alien yeah. is a great example of the thesis is. you I've just really proposed. I agree. I, mean, I think the bad, yeah. the thing There's is nothing a bad redeeming example. redeeming about Alien, the yeah. creature. It's, it's absolutely nothing. Terrifying. Nothing. It's a killing machine. It is yeah. pure evil. Exactly. Yeah. Like the pure, shark in Jaws. Pure. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's nothing yeah. about it that you can embrace. There's nothing you can understand. Well, it's actually not pure evil. It's pure other, isn't it? That's perhaps other. a slightly other. different yeah. thing. Other. Other. Evil by yeah. our yeah. interpretation. Look what it does to the human body. Look what it does to us. Its whole purpose is to destroy us. This is right-wing evil. This is the evil that we can all mm -hmm. gather by the campfire, no matter what country we're from, no matter what color we are, no matter what right. we believe. Yeah. We turn around, mm -hmm. and there it is. What are we going to do with it? We're going to blow it out of the airlock. We've got to. But surely the scariest notion is that behind a human face should be this other. Because somehow the idea that there be this other out in space, as scary as it is, isn't as scary as this other being somehow or other part of my... I mean, one of the things that makes The Exorcist a very scary movie for me is that the other, uh, in this case something you don't even really see in any physical form, invades, uh, uh, you know, Georgetown environment. And, and what's scary about that is that the other has its own reasons, but you never really... I mean, you don't ever really know why Pazuzu takes over Linda Blair. Right. But don't you think well, we're proving uh, something about horror and that it's individual and it, it's, the, it's the act of an individual communicating to others that makes it frightening and it's I, not I, a, I agree with that. a committee. I was just oh, about yeah. to say exactly yeah. the yeah. same yeah. thing. It's from same our again. heart and we, that's what's frightening. Yeah. It's from my heart and, and you can appreciate it. It's from Roger's heart and I can look at it and appreciate it. It's from you, all of yours. That's what makes it frightening because it's personalized. Now I it may be yours or it may be yours. But it's not something that we can all agree on. I think we've discovered that what we started out to do isn't really right. We've discovered something else, which is maybe a more basic principle, that the creative process is an individual process. Right. right. And that every one of us, if we were so inclined to continue with this experiment, should, at the conclusion of this dinner, Go home, create our own story, our own film, and maybe in the year 2000 bring Made back up. our own <laughs> stories <laughs> and everybody oh, show sure. our own yeah. individual yeah. work, yeah. but yeah. based upon the ideas and the concepts that have been discussed here tonight. All right, but, yeah. but we're still left sure. with, uh, with, with, our, with our brief, mm -hmm. which was to create a, a, a thing which is the product of six very disparate minds. Mm. There is another way to do it, and that's it's been done before in novels, and that is to um, I will write the first uh, mm. yeah, yeah, right. yes, yes. Right. twenty pages. Yeah. Sure. I'll pass, pass it, it to you. Uh -huh. You pick it up, you pass it around the sure. table, sure. Sure. and then um, Roger uh, can direct it. Hey, we're not going to do I'll it. Be glad no, John, 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 the first on. reel you direct. Yeah, right. the second <laughs> reel. <laughs> but that's a, that's a let's possibility. Allow, let's allow it twelve elements rather than six elements. Let's allow it twice around the table so everybody gets two bites of the apple mm, okay. rather than one. Okay. okay. John? So I must start. Yes. Um, a young girl is, uh, arrives home at the end of the evening. The clouds are beginning to form. It's like a rainy night. She's, uh, let's say she's in her 20s. She's come home from work. She lives alone. She comes in her apartment. Perhaps a storm begins outside. She uh, takes her coat off, she relaxes, perhaps has a drink. Normal life at the end of the day. And the storm begins to intensify outside, and then it begins to rain. And we see the rain hitting the windows. And perhaps uh, there's a television or a radio. And it reports uh, some, uh, a murder across town on the east side. It's a very strange kind of murder. It's uh, a body was found and its face, the face of the corpse was cut off. Just the face. And uh, this girl has the sense as she walks down the hallway to her bedroom that there's someone out there who's perhaps collecting faces. And she feels not only fear, but guilt somehow.
like she's a part of it. And there's a giant crash of lightning and, and the power in her, her apartment goes out and this is just as she opens the door to her bedroom and there's this blue light coming through the window. She looks across the room and <laughs> the light focuses on her pillow and the face is there. She smooths out the pillow. No face. Nothing there. Just a smooth pillow. The lights come back on. The power cut is out, you know. Everything's fine. She's got dinner with friends across the city. She goes down to the, the subway. Sits down, you know, on, on the kind of subway clientele, just, you know, folks, folks there reading bestsellers and, and, you know, odd bag ladies, and, but generally a sort of ordinary, nothing, nothing very threatening. And the, the, the PA system begins to whisper to her. And she's not quite sure. It's either saying to her, you're next, or you did it. <laughs> so, you know, she, she looks around. No, nobody else seems to be noticing anything. But again, there's, you're next. <laughs> or whatever. So she gets off the other end, goes to see her friends. And as she walks through the door, they all, they don't obviously back away, but they, 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 they look at her a bit askance and something is clearly wrong. So she says, well, what's wrong? Is, is it me? Uh, I mean, I... <laughs> um. <laughs> Is it me, she says. And uh, the host at the table says, yes, but only a little part of it is you. See, um, we've known each other now. The girl's name is Janet. We've known each other now, Janet, how long? She says, ooh, since, uh, since I was very small, since I was three. And... Uh, <coughs> The guy says, um, see, all that time, in a way, you've been in training. And everybody at this table has been in training. See, there's a, a problem with our faces, Janet. Our faces are fake things. Our faces have always been fake things. They're things we put on over our truest feelings. And it is the belief of this community gathered around this table that it's best for the world if we remove the fakery from life with scalpels. That we go about this city nightly and we remove the faces of the liars and the cheats and the hypocrites who occupy the planet with us. But after tonight, our great plan is... She just slams her hand down the table and says, You're crazy! And she leaps up, gets the hell out of the house. It's now storming down. So she's sort of rushing off through the storm and the rain and battling, but just wants to get away, wants to get away. She's maybe heading towards a police station, but no way, no, no. She's not actually going to report these old friends of hers to the police. But she's got to go somewhere. She's got to talk to somebody. Who can she trust? These people she's known for ages. But, well, if it's not the police, well, there's the press. And there's this guy she used to go out with. Maybe he writes for The Voice, or maybe he writes for The Times. I don't know. But she goes, say The Times. She goes there, because late at night there may still be somebody there. Goes in. Luckily, he's there. Hasn't seen her for ages. Hey, happy to see her. It's normality. It's a newsroom. It's kind of messy, and there's people sitting around. Phone's ringing. Noise. She's wet. He buys her some coffee, kind of gets her a towel for her hair, and he's normal. He's like the guy she's known, and they start talking, and she can't quite tell him what's happened. It just seems too weird.
she just says, <laughs> these people, <laughs> don't know, they really freak me out. I don't know. don't know what it was. But they start talking. She's starting to trust him. Something's going on between them. So he says, let's go out. Let's get you, you know, you didn't get your dinner. Let's go out. We'll go get something to eat. So they go out. They have a nice meal. It's relaxed. It's kind of things are getting back to normality. They go to his place just for a coffee. He'll take her home later. They go in. She goes in. She goes back to the bathroom, opens the door, and there's a faceless body in the bathtub. The faceless body hands her a scalpel <laughs> and says, cut me. She turns, starts to move out, and there's another faceless body behind her at the door holding another scalpel. She has no way to go. These are the only two areas in the room in which she can move. Almost paralyzed with fear, she takes the scalpel and starts to cut. She cuts off what is left of the face, cuts in, no blood comes out. She cuts deeper and deeper and deeper and cuts away level after level after level. No blood ever flows, no voice ever sounds until she is cut all the way through and there is nothing. She turns to the other person now with glee. She takes the scalpel and begins to cut the other faceless person. She repeats the same process, stroke after stroke after stroke, and again, there is nothing there. She now begins to understand something. It's not a voice. It's almost a feeling of understanding. And the understanding comes to her, and somebody or something says, this is the millennium. 2,000 years ago, we sent a man to this earth. That man was crucified and his mission failed. We came back a 1,000 years later to find out if there had been progress, if we could find another on this earth. We have not, we failed in our search and we withdrew. Nobody knew we were here in the year 1,000. We have come back again in the year 2000. We have found that person. That person is you. And your job is to <laughs> reveal the wisdom that failed to be revealed 2000 years ago. Janet rejects this because again, she thinks this is crazy. She goes to sleep. She's not having any of this. She's rejecting it all. She knows she's the chosen one. The audience knows she's the chosen one. She begins the second day by, in, in an act of rejection. As she goes through an attempt at a normal day, what begins to happen is that it moves beyond the body. <coughs> she looks at photographs of the old friend she had the dinner party with. She looks at a, a newspaper article written by the, the journalist friend of hers with, with a headshot of him. And the photographs begin to move, as does her reflection in the mirror. And what all these images are saying to her is, there are no surfaces. It's not only the bodies that don't have surfaces, there are no surfaces. Every surface you think is in this world is an illusion. Your job your role, the role you were born for, is to reveal to the world the absence of surface. It's not enough to take the skin off. It's not enough to be a serial killer. You must go beyond that act to reveal the secret reflection, to reveal the life beyond the mirror, the life behind the photographs, the life behind the face. Th these are a series of, sh of shock moments that work through the day. That summation of that mission is revealed towards the end of the second day. When she calls back the friends, she says, I'm, I'm receiving other messages. You know, I, perhaps I shouldn't have left the dinner party. 
she calls the guy from the newspaper who now speaks to her in a different way, more reminiscent of other people she'd met before. All these people know something, but now they speak not in that revelatory way, but in a respectful way. And they suggest that perhaps what they need is, is another meeting. Another meeting which will be bigger than the previous meeting, a meeting that will involve more people. And that meeting will be held in Central Park. It's evening. She's led to Central Park. And there are thousands of people converging around the edges. Some faceless, a mass of pulp, some with their faces. But all seem to be driven by some inner voice, a confluence, a, a moment that they're all driven to. And she begins to be caught up in this, in this, in this drive. And suddenly out of the crowd there's this, there's this man who turns and sees her and, and their eyes meet for a moment. And there's something between them that's human. It's not uh, savage, or ripping faces, or, or, or a crazy uh, unreality, but there's something in their gazes that, tell, that tells each one, this is somebody I can trust. But they're very quiet because there's a giant crowd. And the people around Central Park whose faces remain, each pull out of their pockets knives, <laughs> scalpels, garden implements, pieces of glass, and they all begin to tear their faces off. And as they tear their faces off, they begin to chant. These strange sounds come out. They're, they're like words, but they're not words. And this man gets closer to, to, our, to our heroine, Janet, and she, she grabs him and says, please, let's go. Let's get away from here. And somehow they, they move away from the crowd as these bleeding faces are dropped into Central Park. So they race back away from this area, down the streets. And as they do, they notice that the, the power system of the city is beginning to flicker and the, and the buildings are beginning to go dark. It's not resembling a city anymore, it's resembling a kind of flat mosaic, almost like Stonehenge with giant slabs of, of buildings around. And, it, and anymore the landscape is not civilization as we know it, it's not modern life, but this is some kind of moment in hell. And they race down the street. This man is a theoretical physicist. He studied quantum mechanics. He studied uh, relativity. And he tries to make some sense of all this. And he says to her, <laughs> God, damn. God. Meanwhile, <laughs> in another part of the city. In another part of the forest. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, the police, all of whose faces are covered with visors, and psychiatric nurses, all of whose faces are covered with masks in case they catch some bug from the masses in Central Park, have arrived, and they're carting off by whatever means necessary, these, the, 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 the crew that has arrived in Central Park. And pretty soon, it's almost possible for the populace to pretend that what has happened has not happened, except <laughs> that they have real problems coping with the fact that the geometry of the city has changed. And that in many ways, if you go around a corner you went round yesterday, you'll find yourself in a place you never saw before. 
And if you look through a window that you looked through yesterday, you'll see a vista that you never saw before. But this doesn't actually cope with what he says to her. He may just say, let's get out of here, honey. <laughs> they never say that in horror movies. Well, doesn't it's your here, line, Clive. <laughs> <laughs> he says, one of the things that's been happening in my area of quantum physics, which is not an area that most people know about, <laughs> <laughs> is that the, the whole area of, of relative realities is being explored. And one of the things which is under siege is the whole notion that we as operating human beings, as personalities, um, keep the notion of reality buoyant. We, uh, we keep the idea uh, that the world is as the world is by a global act of will. The process of the imagination uh, is indulged for the first five years of our lives and thereafter removed from us because if we were allowed to keep it, if we were allowed for one moment to sustain the idea of Oz or Never Never Land and enough of us believed in Oz or Never Never Land then sooner or later like the world which we share a belief in, Oz or Never Neverland would come to be. What we are trying to do, he says, we analytical quantum f physicists, <laughs> is fight a very distressing anarchistic urge which is going through a cult around the world, which is simply removing personality. And the classic way of removing personality is to remove the face. And behind the facade will be revealed a reality of such horror occupied by creatures of such revulsion that life will not be worth living. And the ritual that you were just a part of was the ritual of revelation. The, re the release of the face, the release of the personality, the release of our sense of reality. The moment that goes, the things on the other side will break through. And he says something more. He says, I know what the things on the other side look like, Janet. They are. <laughs> She says, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Stop <laughs> saying that. <laughs> I've heard all this stuff about consensus reality. Do you honestly expect me to believe that we've just been maintaining this fragile structure of reality based on an agreement among people who can't agree about anything? And that really, reality is so horrible, we can't possibly bear it. Well, I think that that's the story. I think that reality. If it's reality, why should I go on living in a fantasy world? And she pulls out her razor, reaches up to her face. And is just about to cut her face off when the professor of quantum mechanics says, stop. <laughs> there are various theories of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. I can quote the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which states that the movement of the electrons around the nucleus is a random pattern to which his great rival Einstein said I cannot believe that God plays dice with the universe actually Janet both Heisenberg and Einstein are correct there are indeed two universes one universe in which God and one of his disciples, Ronald Reagan, 
<laughs> it became a comedy. <laughs> I believe comedy is part of horror. So I do think there is a similarity. At any rate, God and his disciple, Ronald, believe that God does not play dice with the universe. That the universe is a structure of pure order. Everything is preordained. Everything is organized and perfect. The second universe, discovered and interpreted by Heisenberg, is a universe conceived of also by God and his disciple, Groucho Marx. <laughs> now, <laughs> God and Groucho believe in the Heisenberg concept of random action in which indeed behind our faces are monsters but behind I should say behind some faces are monsters behind other faces are beings of beauty and come to think of it there's a third which are kind of in between <coughs> Now, Janet, we came back 1,000 years after Christ. We now come back 2,000 years after Christ. And we tell you that mankind has one final 1,000-year period to exist. This 1,000-year period will be an experiment. You will determine, and your disciples will determine, in this coming thousand years, whether you are going to define for yourself the universe of Ronald or of Groucho. And at the end of this 3,000 years, <laughs> <laughs> something may happen. But before you make that choice, Janet, I have to tell you, you remember that census that happened a few, few months ago in your hometown? where the people that came to your door seemed to know something about you that you would rather they didn't know. What they knew about you, Janet, as I'm sure you remember, is that habit you had. And I'm here to tell you, Janet, that it's all right. The Messiah we spoke about 2,000 years ago despite what your history has told you, despite what this confusing universe of multiplicity has suggested that the Messiah might have been Jesus Christ. No, it was Herod Antipas. The correct thing to do every millennia, Janet, is to slaughter the innocents. We're very proud of what you did before this story started. And your job for as long as you live, and until you can find somebody to pass the job on to, is to continue slaughtering the innocents. However, we are obliged at every thousand years, at every millennia, at this juncture, that's a very Bush phrase, isn't it? At this juncture, to give you the choice. You are by nature Herod. You have a history of child slaughter. Do you choose to do this? Or do you choose to take us beyond that? I refuse to end this movie. We've been around twice. That's her choice. What would we all do? Slaughter the innocents. Slaughter the innocents? If we were a true committee of a major studio, we would do some audience research. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many of you want the innocents slaughtered? How many of you hate your children? I don't know any innocents. But I'd like to point out something, that each aspect of the tale as we went around, around the table had a power and a uniqueness and a, and a point of view that we couldn't get together. Yes. But we could get individually. Yes. And is, isn't that the, the entire the premise of the story? Mm. It comes down to one individual. It comes it down to, sure. the per, the, to the human being. Isn't yeah, that we're all interested in that going into the movie? We're all interested in, in, in what that means to us indiv individually. What does it mean to be a person on this planet, in this, in this culture? Sure. Sure. And you can distance us by making us into uh, 
Bela Lugosi or Boris Karloff or makeup or mm. vampire or whatever. But really, we're talking about uh, what everybody thinks about, what everybody has on their mind. Because horror is a part of, of all of us, our fears. And I think, uh, if anything, we, we try to express it in, in words or, or images. But we, ex we try to express what really is in everybody out there in uh, TV land.